I got to sing with the worship team this morning. Did you hear that? It's just getting to read words, but hey, there I was. Mark chapter 5 is where we're going to be. Have you ever felt helpless? Like you were maybe dangling by a wire, not much supporting you or keeping you there? Well, that fear was a reality for students in the remote province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan, who have to use a cable car to get to and from school. Six students and two adults became trapped in the dangling car 1,200 feet above the ground after one of the two suspension cables broke. Rescue efforts were impossible until a helicopter and an experienced rescue officials were made available. It took 14 hours to rescue the children and adults from the car because of high winds, nightfall, and a weakened state of the children who became uh, dehydrated and suffered from nausea. Thankfully, all on board were rescued safely because of the sacrificial actions of those rescue personnel. In such a situation, it's hard to imagine anyone turning down an offer of rescue because the threat was so real and so immediate. I mean, as an adult, I can't imagine that. As a kid, I can't imagine that. You're in a car that's dangling, and you know how far it is below, and it's windy, and something tragic has happened, and your mind is thinking, can something more tragic happen? And you're not just there for a little while. You're there through a day, through all the night, and into the next morning with nothing but your own thoughts, right? Which can be good and can be bad. And so you can imagine that if you were in a position or a situation like that and someone offered you their hand, someone offered you a way to safety, right? They made themselves available to you. You take it, right? I mean, you might be scared to take that first step. You might be scared for, you know, because you're thinking, okay, at least here I know it's kind of safe, but ultimate safety comes from the helping hand that's being offered. You take it. But yet, because our lives here today feel safe, and because, well, danger seems less immediate we regularly turn down Jesus' rescue effort that is made available to us, right? Because we think everything is just okay. And so this morning, we are going to read about a woman who took advantage of the availableness of Jesus. And after seeing her rescue, seeing what God has done for her, maybe we will be open to what Jesus makes available to us today. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, what a wonderful name it is. There is no rival. There is no equal. Nothing compares to you. You are amazing. You have done everything for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And God, help us to see that you are available and offering us rescue from ourselves. God, I pray that we will have ears to hear. And God, I pray that we will have a heart that is willing to respond to you wherever we are in life right now. And God, we thank you for this day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's look at what Mark has recorded for us, starting in chapter 5 and verse 25. And this is what he writes. He says that there was a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather she had grown worse. 
And after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought that if I touch his garment, I will get well. Immediately, Scripture tells us, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she had been healed from her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd that's pressing around you, don't you? When yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And so historically, what is it that Mark wants us to see that's going on in this situation? He wants us to see a hurting person come to Jesus. That's what we see here. Someone who is hurting come to Jesus. Jesus was on his way to help the daughter of Jairus. Last week, we talked about how this religious leader, this synagogue official, had come to Jesus as Jesus had gotten out of the boat there at Capernaum and was there at the seashore and basically begged Jesus to come and to heal and to help his daughter. And that Jesus didn't even say anything. He just went with the official. And it's while Jesus is going to do something else that all of this takes place. Now, I want you to think about that. I am a very type A focused person, task oriented, in the moment, in the zone. I have to fight hard to stay there and not get distracted, right? I don't get distracted easy. Sometimes I need help to pull me away from what I'm hyper-focused on so that I can see the world that's going on around me, right? Aren't you glad that Jesus wasn't that way? Jesus was focused. He was going to go help Jairus' daughter, right? He was going to do that. He didn't even say anything. But yet, while on the way, aren't you glad that he didn't say, I don't have time to stop? I don't have time to consider? I don't have time to think of you because that's what's going on here. This woman who is hurting is making her way to Jesus, and Jesus is approached from the, within the crowd as this is taking place. Now, I want you to think about this woman. If we're not careful, sometimes we miss the weight of the details that we have recorded in Scripture, okay? And so this woman had suffered for 12 years with an ordeal that was all-consuming, with something that required constant attention. What were you doing 12 years ago? Can you think? Can you think about how your life was different 12 years ago? We have some in our congregation this morning that weren't here 12 years ago. And yet we have some that aren't here with us who were here 12 years ago. A lot happens in over a decade, does it not? Can you imagine being afflicted with something that had consumed your life for 12 years? required your constant attention and your constant thought. Can you imagine how that would weigh on you? How that would affect you mentally? How it would change the way you see the world around you? That's what's going on here. She had suffered. Maybe you're suffering today with a weight of something that maybe only you know about because you try to keep it hidden. Maybe only a few close people know about. 
This woman was alone. Now you think, okay, pastor, you just told me she was in this huge crowd. Jesus, you know, his disciples even make this sarcastic comment. What? You want to know who touched your garment? Have you not seen the crowd that's around you? And so if that's the case, how could she be alone even in this big crowd? Well, this hemorrhage had left her unclean. And because of this, she had been unable to worship at the temple in public. And if she was married, she would be unable to share the bed with her husband privately because of it. And so even though she's in the midst of this crowd, she's alone. I mean, she doesn't have contact with people like we would normally have contact. She's battling what's going on with her body and with her mind, and she feels isolated. And maybe you feel isolated today. Maybe what's going on in your life, the things that are pressing upon you, the things that you're suffering through make you feel isolated. This woman was broken in spirit. I mean, think about this. Scripture tells us that she had tried everything, right? Maybe you've had something in your life where you've tried everything. Every something that somebody mentioned, every something that you read about online, right? Everything that you thought would help you with whatever is going on, whether it was physical, whether it was emotional, whether it had to do with relationships, right? Because after a while, We almost get so desperate, right, that we are willing to try anything, correct? And so that's what we see here with this lady. She was broken, having tried everything, but not just that. She had spent everything she had. That's how desperate she was. She wanted to be made well, better, She wanted things to be different. Maybe you're that way today. Maybe your life's in a thousand or a million pieces on the inside. Maybe it looks all put together on the outside, but maybe you're struggling with stuff. Things that maybe have happened to you. Maybe things that, you know, are your own design and you thought were going to be great when you started, but so far has turned out to be something nightmarish. That's where this lady was at. And in spite of this, and because of all of this, she risked getting out in this crowd to come to Jesus. There should come a point, hopefully, right, where we are willing to do the one thing, go to the one whose name is above all names, right? The one who is all-powerful and can do all all things, regardless of how scared or uncertain or whatever fears that we have that are going on in our life, right? And that if she can do this, if she can risk getting out in the crowd to come to Jesus, then maybe you can too. So let's look at what's going on on a deeper level. This is what's historically going on. What's going on theologically? What is it that was being said about God in this situation, right? Because Jesus is in the midst of this situation, right? He's in the middle of this crowd that is moving with him. And so we see a hurting person come to Jesus, right? He wants us to see why we should come to Jesus. The why behind it. And here it is. There are limits to what we can accomplish on our own without Jesus. There's only so much mental strength. There's only so much physical strength. There are only so many resources that you and I have that when we exhaust them, that's it, right? But yet there is one who has power and resources and ability that goes beyond anything that we can comprehend. And so there is no limit. This woman, as I had said, spent most of her adult life looking for an answer to her problems without, her, without success. She had gone all of these years. She had gone to all of these physicians. How many? Many. So many. 
This woman had gone to these many doctors and that her endurance wasn't a matter of this continued strength. This endurance here was the emotional suffering that was caused by this ill treatment, this heavy toll upon her of those who were supposed to help, right? Because sometimes there are things that make sense to us that we think are going to help that really just cause more problems, right? Sometimes there are those who have good intentions that end up causing more pain. Maybe some of these doctors really were compassionate. Maybe some of them were only interested in her money. I mean, I don't know, but she suffered, it tells us, Scripture does. This woman spent all of her money, sacrificed in all of her finances, and did you notice that what the comma after that was? And it only got worse. I mean, it didn't like maintain, it didn't plateau, it got worse. There is a limit to time, to will, and to money. But Scripture says there is no limit to what God can do. And so there is truth that God provides the power to overcome, telling us that he can heal our wounds, that he can bind our broken hearts. And and so, yes, he can do that. And maybe you have cried out, and maybe you have prayed, and maybe you've wondered, well, why hasn't that exactly happened to me? We see that it's going to happen to this lady, right? right? But sometimes maybe you realize physical healing doesn't come the way we expect it to, or maybe the problems aren't solved the way we want them to be. Ultimately, we know that stuff will be solved on the other side of glory. We know that for sure. But yet, not only can God give us the power to overcome, but sometimes it's different, and he gives us the power to be able to deal with it while we were here. He tells the apostle Paul, Jesus does, that my grace is sufficient for you. What I have given you of myself is everything that you need. And while what you're asking for might not be removed, God's presence in your life and his power in your life can give you the ability to continue to move forward. Without him, I mean, we're lost. It's hopeless. But with him, we can make it through. And so that's what we see going on here. And so the woman, while the woman seems to have exhausted everything before turning to God, we don't. She was at her wit's end. Today, you don't have to necessarily get to your wit's end before you come to Jesus. You can do that today. Well, let's look on. Regardless of our situation or condition, Jesus is aware of us. She felt alone, but Jesus knew about her. Jesus knows about you. Jesus knew of her presence and her need, and this word immediately, revealing that this knowledge was not just something that was just instantaneous, he had it, but it was an impression of the situation, and he had his complete right understanding of what was going on. Jesus has a complete understanding of your life, and he knows exact your need and what needs to be done for you. We can trust him because he's our heavenly father. We can trust him because his name is love, right? He wants the absolute best for you and I. Jesus understood that what needed to be done for the woman because this word perceiving, perceiving that this power had left him, expresses an experiential knowledge, one of a relationship. And so Jesus understood her need because he knew her. How did he know her? Well, he made her, right? Fashioned and formed her in her mother's womb, knew the number of hairs on her head, right? And so as God, he knew her. He had this relationship, whether she had it or not. He understood all of this. Jesus made it easy for the woman to interact with him. Notice that it said, turning and looking. Jesus turned and looked for her. Now, if he knew, if he understood, he knew exactly where she was, right? 
Just as today, he knows exactly where you are. So that gets us to this question. Who is it that touched my garment? Does Jesus know who touched his garment? He absolutely knows who touched his garment. So he's asking this question, not for himself, but for who? Everybody else. And so he's saying this question so that his disciples understand that he is conscious of all things that are going on around him, right? He is aware of the finest detail. Where you and I have details that escape our lives, nothing escapes the notice and the attention of Jesus. And so he wants his disciples to understand that. He wants the crowd around him to understand that it's not about the spectacle, that it's about the person, right? People are the reason why he came. Jesus could have done something spectacular, and we would have all been dumbfounded and said, well, yes, we're going to follow him, but we're following the spectacle and not with the reason of the heart. And so he uses a personal relationship to draw us to him so that we follow him for the person. When we realize he is the point, when we understand we are the point and not the fancy stuff that's going on around us, right? While we love our building and while we love the cool air and while the lights give us the ability to see and give us the ability to accent and do great things, it's nothing about that, right? It's about the word of God himself, and people that make the difference. Because there are people on this day worshiping Jesus out underneath all of creation that have nothing but themselves and maybe a copy of God's Word. And God is there doing amazing things in their midst, right? And so we need to understand that. He said it for the woman ultimately. Because did you notice that she had fear and trembling? She was afraid to be in that crowd. She was afraid to get close to him. She was just thinking, if I can just grab the bottom of his garment, that's all I need. And so he responded so that she could have an opportunity to respond herself. God removes every barrier possible so that you and I can connect with him. No hoops to jump through, no obstacles. He just wants himself and you. And we see that in this interaction. There is no real way that woman could have made it to Jesus in that crowd had he not been aware. I mean, you can try. Yes, things can happen. But hey, I've been in crazy crowds. Have you? And sometimes you just don't go where you want to go. And sometimes things just don't happen the way you want them. He made it happen. It is for this reason that Jesus made himself known, right? He came to dwell among us and that he invites us to know him. Come you who are heavy laden, right? Who are weary, who are weak. Take my yoke upon you. My way is easy. My burden is light. Learn from me. Let me teach you. That's what Jesus is extending to us. Do you think her burden was heavy? Do you think that when she knew that something happened to her, She knew something had happened to her, right? That there was a change about her physically and emotionally, that something amazing had happened. Yes, God can do that. Jesus did this for the woman so she could come to God. And guess what? He has done it for you too today. Well, let's look at this last thing here. Success is guaranteed because Jesus can do what we can't do. All right? Does God fail? No. Ultimate success. That's who we have in Jesus. He does what we can't do. Well, what did he do? Jesus made her well by causing her hemorrhage to dry up. 
He rescued her from the penalty and the power of her sin. I mean, that same word for heal there is the one we looked at last week for Jairus' daughter, right? It's the word for save. And so he's able to do both physical and spiritual amazing things. He healed her where everyone else was unable, and he saved her when no one else was capable of being able to do that. He gave her peace, revealing to her that she could have rest from her previous struggles and that she was now made whole. Can you imagine the burden that had been lifted off of her physically? But can you imagine really what it means to be complete because what God has done? You are now together with God. Man, that's completeness. That's being back with the creator who made you. That is fixing the problem that took place in the garden, right? Where our sin and our stupidity separated ourselves from God. God didn't go anywhere. We did the separation. We thought we knew something better. And here, God is bringing that completeness back to her. That's the beauty of salvation. That's the amazing thing. Can you remember the day that God made you complete? Man, we don't ever want to forget that. And today, if you have not been made complete, you can be. You can experience what she has and what many of us have as well. Jesus healed her from the tortures of her past. All right. I mean, how many of you get in trouble because you bring up the past? right? I mean, sometimes that happens in relationships, and if it hasn't happened, it will. I mean, you know, but you know, we, we, we have things in the past that hurt us, right? I mean, some people in life never leave high school because, I mean, everything that's happened to them shapes everything. Maybe you had something happen in your childhood that you have a trouble with as an adult. Maybe someone said something to you last week that you're having trouble dealing with today, right? I mean, things make a difference, But yet Jesus is going to overcome her past, those struggles, going to give her a new opportunity and a future. He's going to allow her to grow and to progress in a new way of life. He did something for her that would produce results that would go on and on and on. That healing that happened on that road going that direction was going to forever change the destiny of her life. Don't you agree? I want you to know that salvation by the name of Jesus will change the rest of your life. It will give you a destiny. I mean, that's what we have in Jesus. That's what she experienced and knew. There are some things that are beyond our ability that only Jesus can do. He is driven by his love for us. He even says, as I have loved you, you are to love other people. Think about that, as he loves you. That means God loves you. That's an amazing thing. But not just that, that he understands us. There's a reason why God came and was born of a woman, why he grew up like us. Because experientially, Jesus, the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of man, has walked this planet, has felt your hunger, has understood your hurt, right? Has been tempted as you have. He gets you because he was like you, but yet without sin, because he said no to sin. And because of that, he could take the penalty for our sin and offer us and make himself available as that sacrifice, right? To where if we say yes, we can be reunited with him. So what does that mean then that you and I practically need to do? That if she can come to this realization, then you can too. So here's three really quick practical things that you and I need to be able to do. Because we can see, you know, that anyone, anywhere with any issue can come to Jesus. All right? This woman can come to Jesus. You can come to Jesus. There is not something too awful, too horrible, too whatever 
that Jesus is going to go, yeah, I don't think I can do that. And so how do we need to respond today? We need to listen to the truth about Jesus like this woman did. She had heard about Jesus and took what she knew and she applied it, right? She knew that Jesus had healed. She knew that Jesus had helped. And she knew that if she could get to Jesus, he could do it for her. She paid attention. You need to pay attention. Are you willing to give serious thoughts to the truth of Jesus? Not because we're at church and not because the preacher is talking about it, but because the book that you have access to, the one that might be on your lap, the one that's in your hand or on your phone, has the words of life. And if they are the words of life, then why would we not want to follow them? Why would we want, want to make it a part of who we are? Why would we not cherish it far above anything else this world has to offer. Not everything in the world is bad, but the words of life, folks, that's what we have in the good news of Jesus. He can show us how to make the best use of our time so that we don't suffer regrets, how we can have the best relationships so that we're not alone, how to overcome the hurts and troubles that we experience in life so that we don't end up more broken than we already are, so that we can allow him to heal us and help us so that we can move forward. Are you willing to listen? She did. We need to respond in the moment to Jesus like the woman. Because a lot of times what we do, in fact, we talked about it in our class this morning. Sometimes we know that God wants us to do something. He said it. We feel his pull. But we're thinking, ah, not now. This isn't convenient. Maybe later. Or I'll consider it at a different time. And you know what? Life happens and it gets crazy. And when does that different time come? That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. We are to respond when he says, right? His prompting is the best time to be able to do that. And so we need to be willing to respond in the moment. You need to seek his help to better your life. Now, if you're a Jesus person, you're going, okay, but pastor, I've done that. Yes, but are we living faithfully? Are we applying it to our life? Are we asking for Jesus in the big stuff? And the little stuff, because all of the stuff makes a difference. You know, you realize sometimes how we handle the small stuff is really what dictates how we handle the big stuff, right? And so we, we need to take that to Jesus. Are you willing to come to Jesus because you realize that the guaranteed reward of Jesus is better than any perceived risk? Oh, I know. Possibly getting out in that aisle is scary to do. Possibly admitting that you need Jesus and you don't have all of life figured out, yeah, that's scary, right? Maybe, maybe having to come to grips that you don't have it all figured out, that's tough. But perceived risk versus the guarantee of Jesus and his promises. At some point, folks, there's got to be a tipping point. Today is the tipping point. Ultimately, we need to accept the reality of Jesus like the woman. Jesus is who he says he is. Who is he? He's the son of God. Who is he? He is the savior of the world. Who is he? He is the one who gave himself in your place to give you a better life. Who is he? Well, in the eyes of those Pakistani children, he is the man dangling from a rope from a helicopter 1,200 feet above the ground, who's sticking his arms into a dangling cable car and saying, come with me if you want to live. I will give you the promise of a life in the future, right? And if you were the one in the car, you're going to go for it. And so I'm challenging you today to reach out to Jesus and respond to him who's made himself available to you. She reached out and she touched him, knowing that the presence would influence and impact the rest of her life forever. You know when forever starts? Today. 
That's when forever starts. I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to the availableness of Jesus today. He says, follow me. Jesus does what we cannot do for ourselves. Yeah, there's a lot we can do, but man, there's so much we can't do. Jesus has made himself available, and no matter where you are in life right now, he says, take my hand. Come to me, and I will save you. Come to me, and I will help you with what's going on in life. Come to me, and I will give you a purpose in life. And so that's the three things I'm going to ask you to do. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never asked him to save you, if you've never come to terms with your sin, well, today you can, and you can be a Jesus person. Come share that and make that proclamation.